Hey everybody, in today's video I'm going to do a super speedy evaluation of a PC that I bought. I've already stripped the components out here, so I've already got a head start. But I'm going to try to do this in maybe 10 minutes or less, just to see what's working, what's not. So that's coming up right now on Retro Hack Shack After Hours. All right, everybody, welcome back to Retro Hack Shack After Hours. My name's Aaron, I'm going fast, I've had a lot of coffee, and uh, trying to get, just share with you some of the stuff I find at eWaste to see if it works. Now, this particular PC that's in components right here, because I just stripped everything out, is actually from a desktop um, AT case that I found, and I didn't want the case, so I just stripped everything out of it, and that's what you see on the table today. I've got a bunch of other desktop uh, cases. I don't have room for empty cases. And I want to be able to use this if it works. I'd like to be able to use this machine to test ISA cards and VLB cards because uh, this particular motherboard has VLB slots on it. I'll show you a close-up view of that in just a minute. Now, the first thing I did when I took this out was I tested the power supply like I normally do. This, uh, the power supply that was in here was really crusty and really bad. I might try to do a repair on it because I don't have very many AT power supplies left. This power supply I know is working. So when we test this, I'll be testing with a known good power supply. Always the first thing to check in my opinion when you're working with this old stuff is are there shorts on the power supply? Do you get the correct voltages? And then of course, are there shorts on the motherboard? Because there could be tantalums or other capacitors that have gone bad and created shorts on these uh, motherboards. Speaking of the motherboard, let's take a look at that first. So here we go, an AT motherboard, and uh, I'm assuming that this processor, just based on the layout of the board, and this is a socket three socket here, so I'm guessing this is maybe a 486 that's in here. We'll find out in just a minute. But it does have a full complement of, I believe this is L2 cache up here, and it's got this interesting stack of memory here going from small to medium to large. So I'll take a look at this in a minute and see how much is in here if it's working. Now the other thing I see since we're in this corner is I see a Varda battery and there's some glue down there. It has started to corrode right in there. So definitely going to be getting this out and probably treating this area with a little bit of vinegar before I do, uh, before I try to power up the board at all. The other nice thing though about this board is it has lots of ISA slots and three VLB slots. So uh, this board also came with some VLB cards installed. So let's take a look at those. And this is the first one. It's a video card. Unfortunately, it's nothing super special. It's an S3 card. I believe it's an S3, does it say 805 on here? S3 EAA J2. And it looks like it does have some room either maybe for some more memory here, I'm guessing, because underneath here I see those staggered pins, uh, like that vertical memory that goes in. So this, this may be some chips for some additional memory for some higher resolutions. And the other card in here was this uh, combined IO uh, hard drive, floppy drive cable or a card that was in here. This is also a VLB card and uh, it's got room for two IDE uh, pin headers on here and a floppy over here. And then it's got some serial and parallel, uh, maybe even, uh, yeah, there's a joystick. And in terms of cards, the last one here is this Linksys Ether 16 LAN card. I believe this was a pretty good card back in the day. I think I remember using these and it's got the, yes, it runs on Novell Netware. Who remembers Novell Netware? I was using this back in Oh, 96, 97, 98, I was using, uh, I was working at a company who was running Novell Netware as their server. So yeah, pretty cool ISA networking card. And there was also this uh, Yi Data, Y-E Data. Uh, I've got some other ones of these in my collection here, but this is a YD-380B. I believe this is a dual speed floppy drive. So it'll, uh, and it also supports, I believe, uh, 1.2 meg. So this is from 1991. So we'll have to see if this works too. Ugh. Underneath a little bit of corrosion there, as you can see. So yeah, I have to clean that up with a little bit of vinegar, but it doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look as bad as it can. It could look. I don't see corrosion with my naked eye on the keyboard connector there. So yeah, maybe we're in good shape here. And look, it actually has pinouts for a uh, Dallas chip that could be placed here as well. That's pretty interesting. 
And there we go. We'll put a little vinegar on there, let it sit for a bit, wash it off with some water, compressed air, yada, yada, yada. Now we have a nice clean board. I met this lawyer. We went out to dinner. I had the lobster bisque. We went back to my place, yada, yada, yada. I never heard from him again. <laughs> Aren't you yada, yada over the best part? No, I mentioned the bisque. <laughs> I don't see any real trace damage or pin damage, so keep our fingers crossed. While I'm waiting for this to completely dry, I just wanted to point out a couple other things. One is this plate. Now this was mounted inside the case and it's a plate for the motherboard. It's a plastic plate. And I wanna use this motherboard for testing and I need something to use kind of as a, a standoff as a way to not short things out on the underside of the board. So the nice thing about this is I'll just be able to put that right back on that like that and have this out in the open ready for testing or whatever uh, if this motherboard actually works. I also wanted to take a look at this processor. And if you look down here, just look at the jumpers down there. So yeah, this is the way it was back in the day. It's kind of like voodoo magic using all those jumpers to configure uh, for the right processor that you installed and sometimes memory configuration and other things as well. Boy, this was a real trick, especially if you lost the uh, manual for your motherboard, um, this was almost impossible to find. Luckily, most of this stuff is cataloged now on the retro website, so that's really nice. So I do wanna take a look at this processor just to see what it is. There we go. Let's see what we have. Ooh, baby, nice, look at that. I did not expect that. It's an AMD 486DX280. That is a darn good processor, awesome. Before this, like 386s, you mostly didn't have to have a fan. I don't think I know of any 386s where there was a fan. But once the 486s started getting fast beyond the, like, maybe the uh, the SX series and stuff, you had to have a, a heat sink. And that was new at the time. So they put this warning on here, heat sink required. Okay, while I was waiting, I went ahead and looked up this motherboard. It is a Biostar uh, MB-1433. There's a lot of different revisions of this one. So this one was around for quite a long time. Um, and what I was looking up was to see if there was an external battery connection so I didn't have to solder things to the board. Makes things a little quicker. And right over here, there is a jumper pin. It's currently on the middle two pins, which uh, is uh, uh, internal battery or, or this battery up here. Needle nose, there we go. Jumper is out. And then the outer two pins, pin one, which is... Uh, up here at the top and pin four. Pin one is a uh, for an external battery. That's the positive lead for the external battery. And then four is a negative lead for the external battery. So I went ahead and made a quick and dirty little attachment for one of these little battery holders with some female pins. And I put pin one or the positive up here and negative down there. And so I should just be able to put that on there and press it down. And now we have a working battery, hopefully, for this motherboard. Okay, it's been about an hour or two hours or so. I think the motherboard is sufficiently dried after all that compressed air. Uh, I've went ahead and hooked up the video card that came with this system. I've got this fan hooked up. I've got a keyboard attached. I've got a monitor attached. Uh, just a note, just a warning. If you're working with high voltages, be sure you know what you're doing. I've got this taped off. So there's nothing really exposed, at least easily exposed, that I could hurt myself with. But anytime you're working with high voltage, please take some precautions. All right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Okay, I've got a noisy fan in that power supply, that's for sure. I do have the speaker hooked up in case there's any beepages. So far I'm getting nothing. And there's no, nothing happening with this cooler here either. Oh, yeah, there is. It's just sticky. It's just sticky. I think I can get that cleaned up and it'll work. So there is voltage going to the system, but nothing on the monitor. I took the memory out. I'm wondering if maybe there's a little water left here. Doesn't seem like it. I'm gonna let this dry a little bit more and then reseat the memory and see if that helps. And I went ahead and soaked the CPU fan in some 91% IPA alcohol. And I also went ahead and lubricated just on this little uh, thing here, trying to get some lube down in the uh, where the motor's spinning there. And then when I turned it back on, it seems to be working as good as new.
Speaking of good as new, how about buying some brand new PCBs from today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offers inexpensive PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. Need assembly services? No problem. They can do front side, back side, through hole components, you name it. They also offer 3D printing, CNC milling, and more. So check out PCB Way for your next project, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Okay, it's been a few more hours. Everything really should be dry at this point. Uh, I started thinking about this. The main reason that I can think of that a board like this wouldn't boot up is if it wasn't seeing any processor at all, like without any beep codes or anything, right? Even if you take all the memory out, I should still be getting some sort of a beep code from the speaker. And of course, I can pull out a postcard as well and see what the error messages is if that's the case, but I'm not getting anything. And so I think maybe there's a problem either with the CPU or with the connection to the CPU. So I am going to go ahead just to cover all my bases here. I'm going to go ahead and put some deoxid in the socket and uh, maybe a little bit on the pins here as well before I put it back in. The zip socket back and forth a few times. Hopefully that's making good connection. Yep. Okay, long beep codes. I think that is the memory beep code. So that's a good sign. Uh, perhaps it was just a couple of bad connections here. Okay, while I had the memory out, I went ahead and cleaned that as well with some deoxid. Um, just by taking a paper towel and kind of rubbing the connections down with a little bit of deoxid, just, just for good measure, since those were already out. Let's go ahead and see if anything different is happening. Fingers crossed. Okay, no beep tone so far. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, look. Woohoo, baby, look at that. 16 megs of RAM, CMOS options not set. This is actually working, I wasn't expecting that. It took a little while and I thought it wasn't gonna work. This is awesome! It's actually working. And we should be able to verify that it's working if we go into CMOS and change a few of the settings. Oh, look at this, fancy, fancy CMOS. Uh, let's set the time real quick. January 1st, 1980? No, I don't think so. Let's change it to uh, January 1st, 1984. 1984 was a good year. And then escape, escape, F10 to save. Will that save? Save changes and exit. Here we go. We've got the video card BIOS there. Memory counts up again. No CMOS problems. So now it's just not gonna find any anything to boot up off of, but hey, really good progress. This was working. I guess it was the connections on the uh, CPU after all. Floppy disk controller failure, fine. That's fine with me, that we're good. Okay, well now I've got this old 850 meg hard drive attached. Let's see if it actually boots. Oh, what a nasty sound. <laughs> that sounds so bad. Yeah, it's not uh, not looking good. I didn't have any hopes for this thing. Just listen to that thing. Oh, this poor drive. You just need to put it out of its misery, I think, at this point. Okay, well, I dug out a MaxTor drive from this bulk buy of hard drives that I just did. And uh, let's just check this out. I think it's... You know, it's probably a little bigger than what would normally be on here, but um, at least it has the cylinders, heads, and sectors printed on it. That helps because you can put that in your BIOS manually if you need to. So let's go ahead and turn it on and see if it detects it. Okay, that's good. Normal hard drive sounds, no screeching. Okay, let's go over and detect master. All right, right away it came up with the right uh, cylinders, head, sectors, and sizes, and all that kind of stuff. It says 505 megabytes. So let's just accept the parameters. Now, I don't know what's on this disk. Like I said, I got it in a bulk buy, so uh, typically I would be wiping this and whatever, but let's just go ahead and save changes and exit. Let's see what happens. Will it boot? Is there anything on here? It's starting Windows 95, no way. 
this drive, literally this drive was just in a box full of drives and it's actually working. Looks like 100% at this point. That's hilarious. Network card is not working properly. Yeah, because I haven't put the network card in. Oh no, that's a different network card. <laughs> of course, this is a completely separate hard drive, but it came up with a network card error, and I was like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a different network. So whoever had this hard drive had a 3Com Etherlink 2, very period, actually, for this uh, setup here. Well, there we go. So yeah, system's working fine, and this hard drive is actually working fine. The only thing left to test is the floppy drive. So let me get that connected. The good news is, is that since that hard drive is working, I'm assuming that this uh, Visa Local Bus um, multi-port, multi-adapter card is also working, which is great news. Uh, but let's test the floppy drive. I've got it connected, and I just want to make sure that um, it is set for a 1.2 meg drive in here. And it is. So we should be good. This thing's also pretty dusty, so I'm just gonna blow this out just a little bit here. Oh, oh. Dust bunnies everywhere. <coughs> okay, well, I've temporarily unplugged the hard drive and I've propped the floppy drive up because it's got a, um, the, the rotating motor that rotates uh, really close to the deck here. So if it was in a PC, in a proper slot, it wouldn't be a problem, but there's only a tiny bit of clearance between that rotating spindle down there uh, and the table. So I've got it propped up temporarily. Um, because the, all that dust came out of there when I blew that air in, I do want to just go ahead and clean it with some IPA. Okay, there it goes. I think this disc is a little warped, so it's even noisier than normal. Let's uh, blow that off a little bit, and then we'll try this DOS 6.22 boot disc. Okay, here we go. That's definitely reading it, starting MS-DOS. Looking for the date. There we go. MS-DOS version 6.22. So no problem. So the floppy disk is working as well. It's a little loud, but it does work. And yeah, I'm amazed everything is actually working. So that was a quick, what did I call it? A speed test, a speed walkthrough, a speed overview. I don't know what I called it. A super speedy evaluation, but I'm super glad that this board is testing. I'm not gonna test the network card. I mean, I can do that later. It's not a big deal to me if it works or if it doesn't work. Really what I want to use this system for is to test other VLB cards, uh, Visa Local Bus, and other um, ISA cards, 16-bit ISA cards and 8-bit ISA cards in a system that I know works and doesn't have any problems. There's a message for me. And now um, this is working just fine. And here we go. Once we get to this screen, it does, yes, indeed, say 486 DX2. It doesn't tell me the megahertz, but could go in and load up a diagnostic disk or something and figure that out. Oh yeah, it does right here. 80 megahertz CPU clock. So it does tell me that. So I couldn't be happier. I've got a nice system, nice floppy disk, a hard drive that works. All these cards both work. So the clock is saving information. I mean, right now, this is exactly how I would want it. Now, I might want to upgrade the memory. 16 megs was probably okay for its day. I might want to see if I can get that up to 32 or 64. I'll have to see what this particular motherboard supports. But other than that, this is a perfect rig for testing on this plastic carrier that's going to protect the motherboard from shorts if I set it down on the table and things. I got to say, I am really, really, really excited that I got this thing working because for a while there, I wasn't too sure. <laughs> but anyway, that's all for me, folks. I'm going to leave a link up here that you can click on if you want to watch more IBM or PC related videos. I'd really appreciate it. And I'll see you over there in the next one. End of line.